<clears throat> All right, guys, good evening. Let's get started. Fast review. 70. In the 20th century, daily life has been revolutionized with the help of small, compact electric motors of less than one horsepower. 90% of all motors built today may quietly and efficiently power our tools, our car windows, and most of our world. All right, so the question is, electric motors, how do they work? All right, so if we're finishing up magnetism, magnetism is generated by magnets in general. So dealing with magnets, you know that every single magnet is going to be bipolar. It's going to have two poles. They're dipoles in essence. All right, so one side is going to be the north pole. The other side is going to be the south pole of the magnet. Let's talk about the naming convention. Why not call this positive, this and negative, positive and negative end? The reason why this is called the north pole, this is called the south pole, is because when you have a magnet suspended through a string, it's going to line itself up on the direction of the magnetic field. So the end pointing towards the north becomes the north pole of a magnet. The other end is known as the south pole for obvious reasons. So if you have a compass, compass is going to be a magnet on a pivot. So using a compass, you can map the magnetic field of any magnet imaginable. Magnetic field lines will start at the north pole of a magnet and they will point towards the south pole of a magnet. Earth is magnetic, Earth is a magnet. Right? So the Earth's magnetic field points towards the north pole of our geography. So the question is what generates the Earth's magnetic field? So we had a discussion about it, so we will just touch on it. We'll do a fast review. All right, so the strength of the magnetic field is gonna be denoted by the letter B. Unit is gonna be T, T stands for Tesla. Magnetic field lines point from a positive, not the positive north pole towards the south pole of a magnet. All right, so when you're dealing with magnets, the question becomes the origins of magnetism. Where does the magnetism originate from? Is there such a thing as a magnetic charge? Is there a magnetic north charge or a south charge? All right, so if you take a magnet, break it into smaller and smaller pieces, it doesn't matter how small the pieces are, each and every single piece is gonna be magnetized. So the question is, where does the magnetism originate from? All right, so we know that the light poles will repel the light poles will attract each other. All right, so the couple of things about magnets or magnetism, the charged particles how they behave inside a magnetic field. What happens to charged particles will get deflected only if they're going across the magnetic field. If they're moving parallel to the magnetic field, nothing happens. If the charged particles are stationary, nothing happens. Only when they're going across the magnetic field, they're going to end up experiencing a deflection 90 degrees in their motion. All right, so hmm. direction of the, the direction of the deflection or the magnetic force can be determined by using the right-hand rule. There are two right-hand rules that we talk about in physics. The first one comes out of calculus. So line up your fingers on the direction of the velocity vector and then curl your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. Your thumb is going to be lined up in the direction of the magnetic force. All right, so that's what you do if the particle is positive, charged particle is positive. If the charged particle is negative, you can do the same thing using your left hand. Or my favorite right hand rule is the one that I use. Uh, this is usually used for college physics students. College physics is the algebra trait based physics. This is a little bit more common sense. All right, line up your thumb in the direction of the velocity vector. Fingers line up on the direction of the magnetic field. Your palm is going to point in the direction of the magnetic force. So we'll call this the right hand rule number one. All right, so this is my preference. I usually use this one. So thumb is lined up along the direction of the velocity vector. Fingers along the direction of the magnetic field. The palm is gonna face up in the direction of the magnetic force. All right, so um, magnet of the force is gonna depend on the angle that the velocity vector makes relative to the external magnetic field. So that's something that we will discuss later on. Uh, so one thing that we need to know two-dimensional representation of three-dimensional vectors. Uh, this sign means that the vector is coming out of the page. This sign means it's going into the page. This represents a constant magnetic field region. So the strength of the magnetic field is getting constant within that region. And notice that the magnetic field is going into the page. Particle is moving in the downward direction. So here's the direction of the velocity vector. Thumb is lined up in this direction. Fingers are going into the page. Palm is going to open to the right. So what's going to happen is it's going to cause the charged particle to become deflected into a circular motion. All right, because the force is at right angles to the motion itself, so it causes circular motion. So, which means that the charged particles going across the magnetic field will get wrapped around the magnetic field. All right, so they will experience a force that's gonna be 90 degrees of their motion. So they are gonna get wrapped around the magnetic field. All right, so that's in essence how the Earth's magnetic field protects us. All right, so it protects us only from charged particles coming from space. So the Earth's, because of the Earth's magnetic field, the charged particles going across the magnetic field will experience a force 90 degrees in their motion, which means that they are going to go into a circular motion. They will get wrapped around the magnetic field that they're going, trying to go across uh, in essence. All right, so now that we have a, some kind of a conceptual understanding of the right-hand rule and the magnetic force, okay, here's the mathematical representation of the same concept. Direction of the magnetic force can be determined using the right-hand rule from calculus. Right-hand rule is known as the cross product. All right, so the velocity vector across the magnetic field, V cross B is gonna give you the force, and the force is gonna be 90 degrees to 
the area at the velocity vector as well as the magnetic field span, span in this case. All right, so between the forces given 90 degrees to the velocity vector, it's also given 90 degrees to the, the magnetic field. All right, so this is the vector representation and this is the scalar representation of the same thing. So key is the charge, which is moving at the speed or at this velocity. All right, so here's the strength of the magnetic field uh, within which the charge is moving at the speed. And this represents the angle between the direction of the motion as well as the external magnetic field, as said. All right. Um, okay, so the meaning of this is straightforward. If the motion is along the direction of the external magnetic field, the angle is going to be zero. There's not going to be any force. We expected that. If the charged particle is not moving, so V is going to be zero. So once again, there's not going to be any force. Notice that this force is going to be, but become maximum. So the magnetic force is going to be maximum when the angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic field is going to be 90 degrees. So at 90 degrees, you get the maximum deflective force, deflection force. So, which means that the uh, magnetic field is going to be, magnetic force is going to be maximized. Okay, so let's just wait just for a second. Okay, I don't know. It's the review. All right, we've done. Okay, so problem number two, we've done this problem. Okay, I want to redo the problem. This is one of the problems that I'm going to ask that you guys focus on studying for the next test. Right, so just want to do a fast review. All right, so B represents the magnetic field. I'm looking at dots. That's indicative that the magnetic field is pointing out of the page, out of the screen in your case. There's no current, nothing is happening to the wire. When there's current in the upper direction, there's wire gets deflected to the right. When the current is in the downward direction, the wire gets deflected to the right, left. Okay, so the question becomes what's causing the deflection? The answer is obviously magnetic force. So how does the current experience a magnetic force becomes the question. All right, guys, when a charge, a single charge is moving in this direction inside a magnetic field, pointing from left to right, Using the right hand rule, I don't care whichever the rule you're using. All right, I'm gonna line up my thumb in the direction of the velocity vector, which is in this direction. The magnetic field is from left to right. I'm gonna line up my fingers in that direction. Immediately, I know that this charge is gonna experience a force in the output direction. All right, the current means a bunch of charges moving in the same direction. So the clump of charge, or charges moving in the same direction. Same thing is gonna to happen to the clump of charges, in essence. All right, so the clump of charges moving in the same direction inside the wire is gonna experience a magnetic force in the output direction. All right, so which means that for a single charge experiencing a magnetic force, all right? So instead of using a single charge through a little bit of algebra, we can come up with this equation. All right, so this is a single charge moving at this velocity, all right? Uh, relative to an external magnetic field is gonna experience a force, which is gonna be 90 degrees to the velocity vector as well as the magnetic field vector. The same thing is gonna happen here. So with the current bunch of charges moving in this direction, all right? Along the length of this wire in this direction, inside a magnetic field, is going to experience a magnetic force. So it's going to get deflected by that magnetic force. So that's, that's the meaning of that equation. All right, so this is as far as we got last time. All right, so what can you do with this knowledge? Plenty is just what happens. The entire 20th century technology based upon it, all right? Uh, you can do plenty of stuff inside by using this technology. Notice that you got this current wire. The current is moving in this direction, boom, boom, boom. And then it's inside a magnetic field. So the current is moving this way. Line up your thumb in that direction. Magnetic field is pointing in the downward direction. So you line up your fingers in that direction. So current is going this way, magnetic field is going in that direction. Boom, it's gonna experience a force in this direction. So it's gonna snap. All right, so now you credit yourself an amazing technology of a snapper. Why, what is it that you could do with something that simple? Oh, you could turn it into a nail clipper, moss trap, and whatever else that you wanna do with it. All right, so you can just trap something. It's just gonna go up and it's just gonna snap. In essence. All right, so it's it. Straightforward device, as soon as there's current, it's gonna experience a force in this direction, it's just gonna snap up, it's gonna spin in that direction. Another application is speakers. You got these speakers, how does that work? All right, so you got this coil, it's called a voice coil, just call it a coil, I don't care. So you got your permanent magnet, voice coil is gonna go into the, the permanent magnet. So you got a coil of, wi coil of wire. What you can do is you can move the current up and down, up and down, in essence. The current is gonna go up, you can reverse the direction of the current, Reverse it again, reverse it again, reverse it again. All right, so that when you place the coil inside a permanent magnet, so what happens? Let's take a look at that. All right, so this represents the current coming out of the page, uh, represents the current going into the page. This wire is connected to that one. This is connected to that one. Okay, so the current is coming out of the page, it's going into the page. So it's a two dimensional cross section of a three dimensional figure under a constant magnetic field. All right, so if the current is coming out of the page, line up your thumb in the direction of the current. All right, the fingers are in the direction of the magnetic field. All of a sudden you realize that this coil is gonna experience a force in the outward direction. 
So this portion of the coil is gonna experience the force in the current. Here the current is going into the page, so my thumb is gonna point into the page, and then my fingers are gonna be lined up in the direction of the magnetic field, and then what happens is it's gonna experience the force to the right. So the bottom of the coil experiences the force to the right, the top of the coil is gonna experience the force to the right. So what happens to the cone? It's gonna get pulled in this direction. So what would happen if I were to reverse the direction of the current? If I were to reverse the direction of the current, this time the cone is gonna experience the force in the opposite direction. Guys, if I wanna to duplicate my sound, my voice sound. Okay, so human ear is sensitive to a frequency range between 20 seconds per second to 20,000 seconds per second. All right, so most of the audible conversation is gonna, it's between 100 to, uh, I don't know, maybe 1,000 seconds per second. So which means that if I were to reverse the direction of the current between those ranges, you can duplicate somebody's sound. All right, so if you're trying to generate 100 seconds per second frequency, you have to reverse the direction of the current 100 times per second. As a result, the cone is gonna vibrate 100 times per second. So that's how the technology works. Okay, the, just about the most useful technology that we get out of it is the, are the electric motors. Right, because just about every, anything, everything that we use is motorized. All right, so this would have been one of the experiments that we would have done in the lab if we had in-person education. So, <clears throat> okay, so the electric motor, is, which means that you're turning electrical energy into mechanical energy. So which means that you get this coil and then you get this coil spin by running a current through it inside a constant magnetic field. Okay, let me just get rid of this. So the question is, how does that magic happen? Okay, when you have something this simple, you don't really see the details because once you get it to move, because there's current running through it, it's gonna keep on spinning. And then put this in a car, check to see if the car is gonna drive. And you will notice that it's not gonna drive because things are a little bit more complicated when you start to put a load on this thing, all right? so. The whole idea is you're getting something spin, which means that the electrical energy, in essence, is getting converted into mechanical energy. So how does that happen? The short answer is just get a loop of wire. All right, so you get a coil, in essence, and then run a current through it, and then it's gonna keep on spinning forever. And that's known as an electric motor. Okay, so this is gonna be slightly tricky, so you kinda have to pay attention to this one. The whole idea is you have to get this loop to spin, and you want this loop to spin a regular speed. So notice that this loop is gonna place on a shaft and you just wanna spin this. Thing. Okay, to the shaft, you can attach the car's wheels or whatever so that it can, you can drive it. Or it could be, I don't know, a washing machine. So the question is, how do you get it to spin? The idea is straightforward. Notice that the current is going up and then it's coming down inside a constant magnetic field region. As the current is going up, line up your thumb in the direction of the wire, line up your fingers on the direction of the magnetic field. So which means that this section of the wire is gonna experience a force in this direction into the page almost. And this section of the wire is gonna experience a force out of the page at an angle. So which means that it's gonna induce a torque, torque, a rotational force on this loop that you're looking at. And boom, all right, so it's gonna experience a torque, it's gonna experience a rotational force. And then what's gonna happen, it's gonna experience a rotational force. And then it's just gonna spin around only once. It's not gonna keep on spinning, it's gonna spin until it orients itself along the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, so that statement was a bit of a too generalized statement. And you're, so which means that it needs to be explained a little bit further. All right, I'm not gonna take you through the derivation. Okay, because it's not that important. What's important is the concept itself. All right, so you got the external magnetic field. It's being intercepted by the area of the loop. The current is moving in the downward direction and then it's going in the upward direction. So the current is just looping around. That's what you're looking at. Right, so there's a constant current within the circuit. So what happens to this section of the wire. If you apply a magnetic field on this section, what's going to happen is the, the current is going in the downward direction, the magnetic field is moving in that direction. So it's going to end up experiencing a force in this direction. It's going to experience a force in this direction. The current is going up here. The magnetic field is from left to right. So it's going to end up experiencing a force into the page. This is going to be experiencing a force out of the page in essence. And if the area is not perfectly lined up, if the area vector is not perfectly lined up with the magnetic field, What's gonna happen is this thing is gonna rotate or spin until the area vector is lined up with the magnetic field vector. So it's gonna experience a torque. It's gonna experience a torque until the area vector, okay guys, when I say area vector, area has a size, also it's got a direction. It's pointing in this direction. So which means it's a vector. So if the area vector is lined up on the direction of the magnetic field, net torque is gonna be zero. So it's gonna stop spinning at that point. That's what it means. All right. Um, so which means that as long as there's an angle between the area vector and the external magnetic field, it's gonna experience a torque. This thing is gonna experience a torque. All right, so let me just check to see what it is that I wanna emphasize at this point from the perspective of math. I'm not interested in anything at this point. 
me just get out of here. So I'm looking, I'm going through the derivation for the torque. Obviously, it's going to experience the torque. The amount of torque that it's going to experience is going to depend on the angle between the area vector. This is a vector and the direction of the magnetic field. So if there's any angle between the area vector and the direction of the magnetic field, that angle is going to be this phi or phi that you're looking at. Uh, let me check to see if I make that clear here. All right, so there's the magnetic field pointing in this direction. And we got the area vector pointing down those in which direction. Okay, so let me just get out of there and then add out to the lecture a little bit. Okay, so you got this area vector. All right, so let's just go this out just a little bit. All right, so what this says is, all right, so it's pointing in this direction. So it's got its magnitude, which is the size of the area, and then it's obviously pointing in this direction. Okay, so that's what it is. And it just so happens that there's a magnetic field within this region, which is being intercepted. We're going through this area. All right, so we've got the magnetic field, external magnetic field is in this direction. All right, and this phi that you're looking at is the angle between these two. All right, so this phi represents this. All right, so what this formula says, if this area vector is not lined up with the external magnetic field, what's gonna happen is this coil or loop is going to experience a force. It's gonna experience a rotational force to line itself up along the direction of the external magnetic field. So it's gonna experience a torque in this direction. All right, this is the Greek letter tau. All right, so if there's an angle, if this area is not perfectly lined up along the direction of the external magnetic field, what's gonna happen is gonna experience a torque until it, it's perfectly lined up. So if there's an external angle between the area vector, this is your area vector and this is the magnetic field. Okay, so this is the scalar expression of a loop which has current in it. All right, so when you read the mathematics, it's no longer math at this point. This, these are summary statements of, of what's going on. All right, as a physicist, when I see an equation like this, I can visualize what's going on. It's almost like reading a novel. All right, when you read the words, you should be able to visualize it. The same thing happens with mathematics. This is a summary statement of what's going on. This says there's gonna be torque provided that the area vector is not lined up with the external magnetic field. So it's gonna, it's gonna experience a torque until it's perfectly lined up. When it's perfectly lined up, what happens to this angle? It becomes zero. While sine of zero is gonna be zero, at that point, there's no torque. It's, so it's gonna, it's gonna experience a torque until it's perfectly lined up. Once it's lined up, it's done. If there's an angle, it's just gonna, if the magnetic field is pointing this way, if there's an angle, this, this thing is gonna rotate until it's perfectly lined up on the direction of the magnetic field. As soon as it's lined up, you're done. All right, that's not an electric motor, guys. This is the reality of what induces torque. There's current, uh, this is a loop. It's got its own area. So this area is gonna have a size. So that's the magnitude. So it's gonna be pointing this way or that way. So which means that it's got direction. So it's a vector. So the area vector is, if it's not lined up on the direction of the magnetic field, there's gonna be torque until it's perfectly lined up. So the torque vanishes as soon as it's lined up. All right, so there you go. So this is what it represents. All right, so instead of saying, oh, so area vector is perfectly lined up on the direction of the magnetic field. It's not only the area vector, which is important in this one, but also the reason why this expression becomes important, the area, the vector, the size and the direction becomes important is because of the current. Current is the reason why everything gets interesting. Okay, if there's no current, I don't care which direction the area vector is pointing. There's not gonna be any incentive for the uh, loop to line itself up on the direction of the magnetic field. So what's important is the tendency or the amount of torque that it's gonna experience is gonna depend on the area vector, but also it depends on the current. The bigger the current is, the larger the torque is gonna be. All of a sudden physicists go, oh, why don't we just combine these into a single statement, all right? So they go, all right, let's just take the current, bigger the current, the larger the torque, and then area of the loop. And you can also in increase the amount of current within this or the, the magnitude of the effect by increasing the number of turns. And then let's call this something new, like a magnetization factor or something or instead of calling it a magnetization factor, they call it a magnetic dipole moment, which means that how much this loop is gonna act like a magnet in essence, all right? So this is known as the magnetic dipole moment. And notice that the magnetic dipole moment is gonna point in the direction of the area vector. All of a sudden this A is gonna turn into a mu. Man, this thing is, it's a simple enough concept, but it requires a lot of explanation. All right, so let me clean this up before we move forward. Okay, so, Instead of using the area vector, now we end up using mu. This is known as the magnetic dipole moment. Okay, so the nice thing about the magnetic dipole moment is it's 
it tells you how much the loop is going to become magnetized, how much it's going to act like a magnet. All right, and it's this magnetic dipole moment is going to have a direction. So it's going to be related to the amount of current that you have. It's going to be related to the number of turns that you have. It's going to be related to the size of the area. Obviously, the direction is going to matter because magnetic dipole moment is going to be in the same direction that you're looking at. Okay, so now we can come up. All right, so the magnetic dipole moment is pointing in this direction. If the magnetic field is coming at an angle, what's going to happen is the magnetic dipole moment is going to try to line itself up along the direction of the external magnetic field. So is the direction of the magnetic dipole moment is the direction of the external magnetic field. So there's an angle. So what's going to happen is this thing is going to spin. It's going to experience a torque until it lines itself up along the direction of the external magnetic field. All right, that's it. So the torque is going to act on it until the magnetic dipole moment or magnet magnetization factor. I'm making things up at this point. The how much the, the loop is going to act like a magnet is going to line itself up along the direction of the external magnetic field. All right, so there's going to be a torque if the magnetic dipole moment is not lined up in the direction of the external magnetic field until it's 100% lined up. As soon as it's lined up, the torque vanishes. Torque vanishes at that point. All right, so which means that we will get things spin until the dipole moment lines itself up in the direction of the external magnetic field. Okay, so it would be a one single spin, half a spin, quarter of a spin, whatever. So this is not going to keep spinning unless we could do something with it. So how do we get things to spin? All right, so the normal represents the direction of the area electron, or with our new definitions, it represents the direction of the dipole moment, magnetic dipole moment. So notice that magnetic dipole moment is 90 degrees to the external magnetic field. So what do you expect? This thing is going to spin. It's going to experience a torque until it's normal, or magnetic dipole moment, or the area electron perfectly lined up on the direction of the external magnetic field. All right, that's it. That's what we're discussing. All right, so the question becomes, how do we keep the coil spinning? If that's the case. We don't mean half a spin, half a turn. We don't mean a one full turn. We mean continuously, how do we get it to spin? Okay, guys, now it's related to this section of the design. This is a cute little engineering design. This is a common design that we got. I noticed that you got half rings and you got a brush. All right, so the brush and half rings. When there's the half rings that are touching the brush, it's gonna be part of the circuit. In essence, this is hooked down to a battery down below. So there's gonna be current, so the current is gonna be going up. And then it's going to experience the torque trying to get its dipole moment lined up on the direction of the external magnetic field, right? All right, so what happens when the, the magnetic dipole moment is lined up along the direction of the external magnetic field? At that point, these half ranks are not going to be touching the brush. There's not going to be any current. If there's no current, what happens is this thing is going to keep spinning because it's got rotational inertia. All right, so notice that there's current. At this point, the current is going up. The dipole moment is not lined up on the direction of the magnetic field, so it's going to experience the torque. And at this point, notice that as soon as it becomes lined up, there's no longer current within the loop. So if there's no current within the loop, what's going to happen? Rotational inertia is going to carry it over, and then it's going to touch this. There's going to be current, so it's going to experience a torque, and then it gets disconnected. Rotational inertia takes over, so it's going to keep spinning in the same direction. So this is how the electric motors work. All right, so this is how the electric motors work on a current loop. Okay, so. Let's take a look at this one, the hydrogen atom, usually my favorite. All right, so the origins of magnetism, you said that you could trace the origins of magnetism to the atoms and molecules. We know that the magnetism is caused by electric currents. Electric current is charges moving in the same direction in essence. All right, so simple hydrogen atom, the classical model. The electron is moving about the nucleus. The motion of the electron creates this microscopic current loop, right? All right, so if there's current, there's going to be magnetism, in essence. All right, so that's the way we were looking at it. The positive charge at the center is not stationary. It's spinning on its axis. So it also creates a microscopic current loop that also contributes to the overall magnetic field of the atom. So each and every single atom acts like a small microscopic magnet, in essence. All right, so now, put differently, if, now let's take a look at the same concept from a little bit more mathematical perspective. All right, so... Let's go back. So the magnetic dipole moment of a hydrogen atom. Okay, so the magnetic dipole mo moment represents how much the atom is going to act like a small magnet, in essence. All right, so you got this current loop. All right, so this is the loop that you're looking at. And then notice that there's this area. You got the area of the loop. So all of a sudden, this atom becomes a dipole, mag magnetic dipole, in essence. All right, so it's dipole moments is going to be pointing in this direction. So which means that the atoms will become small magnets, microscopic magnets. 
All right, so which means that if you can line up your magnetic dipole moments in the same direction, the entire structure is going to become magnetized. So it's going to, which means that the entire structure will become a magnet. And how do you get them to point in the same direction? Well, use an external magnet. So what happens? This magnetic dipole moment is going to line itself. It's going to experience a force, rotational force, the torque, until it lines up itself in the direction of the external magnetic field. When it does so, the entire structure is going to become magnetized in essence. All right, so from the perspective of the hydrogen atom, all right, so it becomes a magnetic dipole moment. It becomes a dipole in essence. All right, so definition of a dipole, obviously, it's a combination of the current, the area of the loop, and the number of turns that you have. Okay, so we don't have number of turns. If you don't have, we're not dealing with wires here. We're dealing with charges. So N is going to represent the number of charges that you have. Okay, so what do we have in this case? We have one single charge. In this case, we have a single electron in this case. All right, area is going to be pi r squared. So we do, a, and then the current represents the number of charges moving in the same direction per second. All right, so we get one single charge moving in this direction. So per second is some that mathematical term that we have to use. Time has to be interpreted in this case. So how do we express time? We can express time in terms of the time it takes for it to complete a single revolution. So time could be the period. And for us to be able to know the amount of time it takes for it to complete a single revolution, we need to know the speed of this electron. Obviously, we know how to find the speed of an electron. That was something that we did previously. All right, so T becomes the period of this motion. For us to be able to figure out the period, we need to know the speed. All right, because if you know the speed, you can figure out, you can figure out the period. All right, so it's circular motion, which means that there is a centripetal force acting on the system. Centripetal force is gonna be electrostatic force. All right, and so from that, we can figure out the speed. Speed is gonna be related to the total path traveled within this time period. Total path is gonna be the circumference. All right, so the circumference is going to be 2 pi r. We got the speed down below. All right, so this is going to give us a reciprocal expression for the time. So we end up getting the time out of that. All right, so we end up getting the reciprocal time. All right, so. Okay, guys, let me just get back to something. What is it that we're trying to do here? Okay, we're trying to figure out, we're trying to come up with a mathematical expression for the dipole moment. Okay, so for us to be able to come up with a mathematical expression for dipole moment, we need to know what current is. For us to know what current is, obviously we know the charge. We need to come up with an expression for time. Okay, now I see what's going on, all right. And for us to be able to come up with an expression for time, we need to know the speed of this charge uh, within this orbit or orbital. And we know the speed can be expressed in terms of total distance over the total time. The total time is gonna be the period of this motion and the period is what we are trying to figure out. All right, so period is what we were trying to figure out. So we come up with an expression for the period, which is this reciprocal expression that we will plug into this formula. All right, so this could be plugged in right there. Let me check to see if that's what I do because this is a live lecture. All right, so that's what I'm gonna do. But before I do that, I wanna figure out what the speed is. And it's, speed is easy to figure out because the motion itself is centripetal circuit motion. So there's centripetal force. In this case, is the electrostatic force. Centripetal force is the force directed towards the center. All right, so we have an expression for the electrostatic force, Q1, Q2. Um, one is proton, charge of a proton. The other one is the charge of an electron. I don't care which one. You take the absolute values of it because it's a scalar expression. All right, so this is both of our unit charges. So we will get to use E for them. All right, so from this expression, just solve it for V. R's with R and square will cancel. All right, that's it. So I'll get the square root of, take the square root of, that when you apply the square root to the e squared, obviously you can pull e out of the equation. Now we came up with an expression for v that we can plug into this equation, and this equation becomes that equation, and that equation is going to get substituted back onto the previous equation. So that's going to give us the current, and then we do a back substitution. All right, this goes on and on and on. All right, so I've done my back substitutions. I end up getting the reciprocal of the time, which gets substituted into that equation. And then when you do that, it gives you a current. And then you get the current expression. All right, so I just cleaned things up. And then, all right, so you do the back substitutions using pi r squared into mu. And then it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Okay, so I'm just gonna let it go forward. I just wanna check to see how far we can go with this. All right. Okay, so I evidently decided to go this far. Okay, so I came up with a mathematical expression for the hydrogen atom. All right, so this is the magnetic dipole of an hydrogen atom, in essence. So this is an expression that we could come up with. K is the electrostatic constant. M is going to be the mass of the electron that you're looking at. All right, so which means that 
you can actually express the dipole moment of a hydrogen atom using a bunch of constants. Pi is a constant, R is a measure value. That's the size of it. K is the strength of the electric side of force and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then what you could do is you could take a look at the dipole moment and look at its relationship to an external magnetic field. All right. So if there's an external magnetic field, this dipole moment is going to experience the torque until it lines up itself, it lines itself up along the direction of the external magnetic field. All right. Normally, you guys are kind of lucky because um, in person education, in person education, this would be one of your test questions. And not only would you have to do it mathematically in the fashion that I did it, you would also have to do it numerically as well. All right, so this is just concepts coming together in essence. Okay, I just messed this up. Okay, so let's do one more review and then move on to the next section. All right, so what do we have? All right, so we discussed the naming nomenclature up north in the South Poles. Okay, so if they charge you their rest, it doesn't experience the force. Moving parallel to the magnetic field, no force. Going across the magnetic field, it's gonna experience the force. Magnetic force, it's gonna be 90 degrees to its motion. The right, direction of the force is determined by the right hand rule number one. The purpose that the right hand rule number one serves is obviously to figure out the direction of the magnetic deflection force. Nine is something that we will get back to. Earth's magnetic field is gonna protect us from charged particles. The charged particles going across the magnetic field. It's gonna experience a force, 90 degrees to their motion, so they're gonna get deflected around the magnetic field. So they will become captured by the magnetic field. So the formula representing the magnetic force acting on a single charge is this one. Angle represents the angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic field. All right, so question number 14. If there's a current running through a wire in a constant magnetic field, the wire will get deflected. The reason why the wire is gonna get deflected is because the current is gonna, the current inside the wire is gonna experience a force, uh, the magnetic force. If the wire is at an angle relative to an external magnetic field. All right, so the person that discovers that the current causes magnetism, right-hand rule number two tells you the direction of the magnetic field. Line up your thumb in the direction of the current. The fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic field. But the current is coming out of the page. In this case, this is the current which is coming out of the page. If the current is coming out of the page. The magnetic field is going to be in the counterclockwise direction. If the current is going into the page, it's going to be in the clockwise direction using the right-hand rule number two. All right, so the electromagnets, obviously, you've got a coil, a wire. The current is moving in the same direction. According to Erdstadt, there's going to be a circulating magnetic field. In this case, the magnetic field is going to be moving in this direction. If you place an iron in the metal, it becomes magnetized. All right. And so it turns into an electromagnet as a result. All right. So the magnetism, the origin of magnetism, can be traced to atoms. Within atoms, you have charges moving, electrons moving by the, around the nucleus. Obviously, that creates a microscopic current loop. If there's electricity, there's magnetism. So these microscopic current loops generated by the orbital motion of charges as well as the spin motion of these charges create these microscopic current loops, the current generates magnetism. So that's the explanation for it. Iron is very easy, easily magnetizable because it's got regions within which the atoms are already pointing in the same direction. Those are known as domains. If you can get all the atoms to point in the same direction using an external magnet, magnet, external magnetic field, then the iron becomes magnetized. Heating is gonna destroy magnetism because heating means implies randomized motion of atoms and molecules. When the atoms and molecules are randomly vibrating and pointing at random directions, overall magnetism gets canceled out. So the effect of magnetism goes out. All right, so it's not possible for the Earth's, is it possible for the Earth's magnetic field to be generated by the surface currents? The answer is, of course it is possible, but it doesn't explain it. If the surface currents are responsible for the Earth's magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field, the main field will be pointing in the opposite direction. All right, so the surface currents do generate magnetism, obviously, but the, that's not, responsible for the main magnetic field of the Earth. The core, spin of the core cannot be responsible for it either because the core has to be spinning in the same direction as the spin of the Earth. So the only explanation that we have is the convection currents inside the core, and they must be moving in the opposite direction of the spin of the Earth for whatever reason. Okay, that's the best explanation that we could come up with. So it's still a mystery. Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker. Obviously, we don't know the exact reason why. The, the only thing that we know is we're in the midst of a reversal process, and that may be the reason why this is happening. All right, so what else do we have? I think this is as far as we got, hold on. All right, uh, okay, we got a bunch of other things. All right, magnetic dipole moment is something that we discussed, so we have to get back to that one. All right, so the magnetic dipole moment is gonna tell you how much a loop, a wire, the current loop, I say current loop, not, it doesn't need to be a wire. How much a current loop is gonna act like a magnet? All right, so it's more like a magnet station. All right, so magnetic dipole moment, it depends on the amount of current, it depends on the size of the area of the loop, and then it depends on the number of contributing factors. If that's a wire, the number of loops that you have, it's an atom, it depends on the number of electrons that it's got and which direction the electrons are moving in essence. 
So the proper unit, understandably, so the current is going to be amps, area is going to be square meters. That's as far as we got. Magnetic dipole moment is going to be directly proportional to current. It's going to be directly proportional to the area of the loop, which is going to be directly proportional to the radius, obviously. So if you increase the area, the magnetic dipole moment is going to increase. Increase the number of turns to the dipole moment is going to increase. All right, we didn't really talk about this, but let's just talk about it briefly. All right, so how's the direction of the magnetic dipole moment is determined? It's the same as the right hand rule number two. Line up your thumb in the direction of the in the direction of the current, your fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic dipole moment in essence. All right, so thumb lined up on the direction of the current, the fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic dipole moment. All right, so here's the formula that gives you, tells you about the torque experienced by a dipole moment inside an external magnetic field. If the vector dipole moment vector, vector, vector the dipole moment vector is not lined up with the external magnetic field, it's gonna experience a torque, that's what it means. All right, so that's the meaning of that formula. All right, the thing that we didn't really discuss is this one. I think this is worth discussing. Okay, so we discussed this one. Obviously, if the magnetic dipole moment is not lined up with the external magnetic field, it's gonna experience a force until it is lined up along the direction of the external magnetic field. All right, so question number 27 is the one that we need to focus on. The reason why we have to focus on it is because you guys are, most of you guys are engineering majors. All right, so this is gonna require a bit of a three-dimensional representation. All right, so this is gonna represent the loop. This is the area of the loop. And imagine that there is an external magnetic field. I gotta find something. All right, so this is the area of the loop is facing this way. And there's an external magnetic field pointing in the same direction. Okay, under these circumstances, notice that the area of the loop, the magnetic dipole moment, which is this, is pointing in this direction. And the magnetic field is parallel to it. So they're in the same direction they're parallel to it. So this is not gonna experience the torque. All right, so the magnetic field is still pointing in this direction. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply a force on this. I'm gonna apply a torque on this. I'm gonna just turn it this way. When I turn it this way, it's magnetic moment is pointing towards you right now. And notice that it's now it's in, at an angle relative to an external magnetic field. So which means that I end up doing work against an external magnetic field, right? doing the rotational work against an external magnetic field in order to spin it. All right, so which means that I end up energizing this loop under the circumstances. I know I energize that because if I let it go, what's gonna happen? That energy that I stored inside the loop is gonna turn into kinetic energy of the loop until it's lined up along the direction of the magnetic field one, one more time. So the amount of work that I do, rotational work that I do in getting this loop out of alignment is gonna become stored in this loop as this potential energy, okay? And that's exactly what this formula represents. Okay, so this formula represents the amount of work that I have to do, rotational work that I have to do in order to get the magnetic dipole moment out of alignment with respect to the relative to the external magnetic field by introducing this much of an angle uh, between the external magnetic field as well as the dipole moment in essence. So the amount of work that I do is gonna go into the potential energy of the loop. You know what that implies? That implies that the magnetic field is also a conservative force field in essence. It is just like gravity, it's a conservative force field. Electrostatic field is a conservative force field because the amount of work that you do against the electrostatic force field goes into potential energy of the charge. In this case, the amount of work that I do in rotating this thing and getting it out of alignment relative to the external magnetic field is gonna go into the potential energy of the loop itself. So that implies that the magnetic field is also a conservative force field. So that's what this formula represents. The angle represents the angle between the uh, magnetic dipole moment and the external magnetic field. All right, so question number 29 is related to this. If you perform work on that current loop by introducing an angle between the magnetic moment, which means that you're rotating the loop, and the external magnetic field, where does the energy go? It goes into the loop itself. It goes into the potential energy of the loop. So it gets stored inside the loop itself. All right, so the magnetic field is pointing this way. I just rotate the loop in this direction. And when I let it go, what's gonna happen? The loop is gonna snap in this direction. It's gonna reach, it's gonna rotate in this direction. It's gonna experience a torque in that direction until it lines itself up on the direction of the external magnetic field. So, which means that the amount of energy that I store in it is gonna turn into the rotation and kinetic energy of the loop. 